He actually had that and the public performed it all, almost all the ways. Um, well, time to begin. So. Okay, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I apologize for missing last week. I had pneumonia and, uh, in fact, was in, the in Mount Auburn Hospital um, during class um, and uh, missed the rest of the teaching, my teaching for that week. I'm feeling better. Uh, I still have a bit of a cough, but I'm very happy to be back. I wanted to begin by um, sharing um, a, 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 an aspect of um, uh, from last week um, that uh, based on um, Professor Unger's um, uh, discussion and uh, and the relationship or the importance of it in terms of uh, politics uh, and the Constitution. And I mentioned it briefly two weeks ago, and that is uh, the importance of what I see as a producerist uh, ethos or producerist sensibility. So from the, the Hamiltonian Ver, a, a version of the economy, essentially from the early republic through uh, the Civil War up to the Civil War in the North, we emphasize it was an artisanal ethos in which people defined themselves by what they created, what they produced. Uh, and most Northerners were farmers, but they were successful farmers. Uh, but there were also blacksmiths and um, there were uh, photographers, and it, it was a small business, and it was usually a family business. And as Lincoln f uh, famously said, that he believed that all Americans, including black women, had the right to receive the fruits of their own labor. That reflected this producerist ethos. And beginning with the rise of um, a uh, mass production and the rise of corporations in the, la in the late 19th century, some workers um, started to define themselves and some people started to define themselves not on what they produce but on what they consume, um, what they purchase. They identify themselves based on their house, based on the things that they have. Um, Although most scholars, in terms of discussing a consumer society versus a producer society, argue that the main shift occurs after World War II, um, in the post-war, post-World War II era, that most Americans were still wedded to this producerist ideology um, until uh, the end of World War II, in which point, with the rise of um, essentially mass consumption. Um, people uh, defined themselves on what they consumed uh, rather than what they, and rather than the nature of their work and that still uh, exists today. Even during um, the labor disputes, an, ex an example of, uh, I think, of not well known but very prominent uh, labor union uh, emphasized this producerist uh, ethos. And uh, Ralph Chaplin uh, was one of the heads of the Inter International Workers of the World, which was um, a, as the title suggests, or IWW, also known as Wobblies. Uh, it was, it had a, a, a considerable significance in uh, the United States from the 1880s until World War I, uh, when uh, almost all the leaders were uh, jailed for mostly trumped up reasons. The major theme of the Wobblies was the notion that all workers of a organization, whether it's a corporation or whether it's a small business, have an equal vote, uh, an equal public voice, and that workers are also artists. Um, there is an art or a craft in producing work, even within a large organization. And they referred to themselves as one big union, so they invited the managers, the highest ranking people to the lowest ranking people as all part of one big union. Uh, and the, uh, so their notion of a union was radically different from most other uh, iterations of a union, 
And in fact, they, one of their, um, their muses was Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass in its embrace of labor, its embrace of equality, its embrace in God's imminence. There was an, a religious aspect to it. Um, and it, as I said, it was a inclusive organization. Uh, they were also, in fact, the, as a union itself, the Wobblies as a producerist um, uh, organization are to, to this day best known for their singing. Um, they sung, uh, they created some of the greatest ballads and popular uh, songs uh, in the United States history. Um, and uh, so two examples of this. Um, they also were seen as a kind of church. And uh, for most of you, most of you know that within a church, music is central to the church because music helps uh, uh helps people become closer uh, to God. Uh, Steg Wallace Stegner, the writer, witnessed an IWW march within which they actually really sang a number of these songs. Uh, and he, he called the uh, Wobblies a militant church which enlisted all the enthusiasm, idealism, rebelliousness, devotion, and selfless zeal of its members. It had its legendary, its legendary, its lore, its songs. And another writer, James Jones, in his novel From Here to Eternity from 1951, which was then a bestseller, uh, described the Wobblies as saying that they, what they really were was a religion. They were work stiffs and bindle bums like you and me, but they welded together with a vision we don't possess. It was their vision that made them great. And it was their belief in it that made them powerful. And sing. You never heard anyone sing the way those guys sang. Nobody sings like they did unless it's for a religion. Two of their, if anyone's interested, I can give you a, a material for it, but the two best known songs are Preacher and the Slave and Sweet By and By. But that's an example of a producerist, producerist ethos within a, a kind of corporate um, uh, economic culture that still um, uh, that um, can still exist. Um, the other so John, just a question about about the IWW. Yes. Did did the IWW recruit a distinctive part of the labor force compared to the AFL, for example? Uh, no, they they were truly democratic. They admitted everyone. But independently of the kind of worker, of the sector of the yeah, economy? Yeah, it didn't matter what kind of worker, um, what sector um, of the economy. They, in fact, they invited the heads of corporations to be a member. Uh -huh. um, they invited African Americans. They wanted to recruit literally everyone because it was a way of, they saw it as a way of democratizing a corporate form of organization by having, uh, enabling every employer employee to have an equal voice and an equal vote mm -hmm. um, and that was that was foundational to um, what who they were what they did they could also be very militant um, so if you know the heads of uh, timber companies um, did not want to a part of it um, they they inaugurated um, sit-down strikes and strikes um, uh, at the point of production, which did not... Uh, so then I have a more general question about the relation of this producerism and the producerist ethos right. that you're describing to the ideas of work. Right. So there, it seems that there have been three main ideas of work in the history of the modern West. Right. right? One has been work as an honorable calling. Right. So you have a trade, a profession. Right. It's it's not just a way of uh, ha having a living, of right. satisfying right. your material needs. Right. It also is a source of respect and self-respect. Right. It's an identity. Right. Now, right. The second idea has been the purely instrumental idea of work. Right. right. Work right. is the lash. Right. You do it out of necessity. Right. And. Uh, you seek the sublime in your family, in your private yes. life, in yes. what yes. Weber called the pianissimo of the personal life. Yes. Huh? Yes. And as soon as you can get rid of work for this instrumental use, you do. Right. That's the idea of scarcity, the overcoming of scarcity and 
in Marx and Keynes and so forth. Right. Now there's a third idea of work, which is work as a transformative vocation, right? In which you, there's a higher idea of, in which you, you, you transform part of the world around you, the yes. natural world or yes. the social world. Yes. Yes. And by transforming the world around you, you begin to transform yourself. Right. So there's self-transformation connected to world transformation. That's correct. And that's this higher ideal. But that ideal has been applied in modern Western history only to elite roles. So the thinker, the writer, the artist, the leader, uh, yes, yes. The, the, the agent of transformation in, yes. in some way. It seems that we have no developed example of a popular enactment of this idea of the transformative vocation. I would say the Wobblies the, are. The idea of the transformative vocation yes. to become accessible yes. to the mass of ordinary people. Yes. And it, it would seem for the, for the producerist idea to be fully developed, it would require not just institutional changes that we discussed right. over the last two weeks, but also the spiritual change That's right. in this direction. That's right. That's why I used the example of the Wobblies. I mean, they, they really saw, they reconstituted work as a uh, as a sacred vocation, as a as a transformative vocation, which is why, and they saw themselves as workers. They also saw themselves as artists. That was central to who they were, and they encouraged everyone to be an artist, whether through one's voice. They were also hugely popular in terms of their imagery. Um, so it leads to a different idea of the value of work, right? Exactly. Because because, as I think we mentioned in an earlier class, Karl Marx and Keynes agreed exactly. that we're on the eve of overcoming scarcity, right. and that when we do overcome scarcity, we'll, a, we'll be able to overcome work, right. the right. need for right. work, right? Right, right. And, that's... And, and I would want to argue that both of those ideas are false. I, I think We're both not are... on the eve of overcoming right. scarcity. And we can aspire to freedom in the economy and not just from the economy. That's right. To the overcoming. Right. Experience. In fact, I would say not only are those ideas false, they're bankrupt. They're yeah. just, they're, uh, it's, it's part, they're part of the problem. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, thank you for those questions. I mean, that's, it's why I used the example of the Wobblies, because they, they saw themselves first as artists and as workers' artists. They didn't make a distinction between, oh, I'm an artist, but I have to go to work. It was very much part of who they were. The two were combined. Um, and uh, it's a very, diff very different um, from the Communist Party USA, very different um, from some socialists, although uh, some socialists very much um, saw themselves as both um, wobblies and quasi-socialists, um, depending on the individual, in some cases, the organization. Um, so that was the, the first um, point that I wanted to emphasize. And second is the, um, the, the necessity and the... Um, the necessity of uh, uh, a transformation um, occurring in the United States today, very similar to the necessity for a transformation um, in the Civil War era. One of the readings that um, we assigned is Charles Sumner's All Rights for All. And if you read that, it, one of his main themes is the crucial importance of necessity in achieving um, and achieving the change and meaning the fulfillment of true uh, equal rights for all, which he argues is reflected in uh, the Declaration and the Constitution. And for Sumner and for many others, the Constitution could only be understood through the Declaration, which is obviously um, many people have argued that point. Um, but um, just some of the, I want to read a couple of um, paragraphs from uh, Sumner to emphasize, you know, he's responding to um, the efforts of white Southerners to reinstitute slavery by another name and to not grant 
uh, African Americans uh, their uh, equal rights. And he, Sumner says, twice already since rebel slavery rose against the republic, it has spoken to us insisting first that the slaves should be declared free and secondly that muskets should be put into their hands for the common defense. Yielding to necessity, and he was right there, these two things were done, arming slaves and freeing them. He's referring to Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and actually Lincoln himself, virtually all Northerners, all, no matter how racist they were before the war, by 1860, late 1863, 1864, said the only reason we can win the war is the crucial support of African Americans. Uh, yielding to necessity, these two things were done. Reason, humanity, justice were powerless in this behalf, but necessity was irresistible. And the result testifies how wisely the Republic acted. Without emancipation, followed by the arming of slaves, rebel slavery would not have been overcome. With these, the victory was easy. Uh, at last, the same necessity which insisted first upon emancipation and then upon the arming of slaves insists with the same unanswerable force upon the admission of the freedmen to complete equality before the law so that there shall be no ban of color in courtroom or at the ballot box and government shall be fixed on its only rightful foundation, the consent of the governed. And, you, and I would say you can make a direct line, this, the importance of necessity for substantive change to the state of the nation that we're in right now, and particularly uh, the um, possibility um, of uh, re-electing a tyrant or dictator. Um, for, uh, if you have not read Mark Danner's um, pieces in the New York Review of Books in October, um, he uh, summarizes the threat to American democracy that currently exists. Um, and in fact, he quotes Dick Cheney, who's no progressive, who in August of 2022, Dick Cheney said, in our nation's 246 year history, there has never been an individual who is a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. And Danner, the journalist, the liberal journalist, says the former vice president's blunt assessment comes as a shock, and yet it needs only a minute or two of pondering to realize that Dick Cheney, a man who, whatever you think of him, knows as much about power and its exercise as any contemporary American speaks a stark truth. By attempting a half dozen or so plots and conspiracies between the election and Biden's inauguration, Trump committed a grave crime against the state. He plotted to overthrow the government and he very nearly succeeded. And after committing this crime in full view of the country, the crime for which Cicero and his fellow Roman senators executed Catiline, Trump not only walks free, but remains the undisputed leader of the Republican Party with the chance, whether he is under indictment or not, to retake the presidency. Is that likely to happen? No, but it is possible it will happen. And that it remains a possibility is deeply disquieting. Trump has done his fellow Americans the service of showing them how vulnerable their vaunted system of government really is. For all their concern about tyranny, the founders put in place a mechanism to remove a criminal president that has proved in the face of a strong party loyalties to be laughably impotent. And in a country supposedly of laws, not of men, the law's workings have shown themselves to be, in the face of a genuine emergency, ponderously slow, allowing a leader who tried illicitly to seize power quite openly to take power again. History offers notable examples of dictators who have come to power through elections but it is hard to think of one who attempted to cling to power through a coup and failed, and to whom the polity, in its blithe unconcern, offered the chance to try again. 
And as everyone knows, his base are these workers from uh, the smaller communities in the United States in which are bleeding and in which desperately need this infusion of a, or transformation of an economic means of production. So there's a direct line between a, an intimate relationship between the discussions we're having on economics and political, political economy and political theory on the one hand and the, and the future of democracy. Now, John, when we were having this over the last two weeks, this discussion about the productivist alternative in yes. the United States, we, I proposed last week to unpack it into three sets of programmatic ideas. Right. Ideas about the relation of the vanguard of production to the rest. Yes. The, pa the path from a knowledge economy for the few to a knowledge economy for the many. Right. Then ideas about the relation of labor to capital, right. in which the notion was the, the emergency problem now is the abandonment of a large part of labor to precarious employment, unstable employment. Right. And then I described a path going through stages once again, right. an emergency solution to the problem of precarious employment right. designed to separate legitimate flexibility from illegitimate insecurity. Right. Huh? Right. Then a second stage in which the government tries to influence the evolution of technology. Right. So that technology is used to enhance labor and not only to replace right. it. Right. Though to some extent it always will replace labor. Right. And then a third stage of innovation in the property regime. Right. In the terms of decentralized access right. to productive resources and opportunities. And then the third was finance. Right. Finance should be forced to be a good servant rather than be allowed to be a bad master. Right. It should be enlisted in the service of the productive agenda of society. Right. And that begins in a series of initiatives to discourage financial engineering unrelated to the expansion of output uh -huh. or the rise of productivity. Right. And encourage the mobilization of the dormant potential of the surplus of society and saving right. for the sake of production. Right. And eventually it leads back to the same last stage, which we consider of the others, of this regime of dem democratization of access right. to the capital resources of society. Right. Now, at the end of the last class, we had a brief discussion of the kinds of social coalitions that might support such a productivist project. Right. And I spoke to those coalitions, not specifically in an American context, uh -huh. but having in mind the whole world. Right. Huh? And with respect to the world, then I developed this thesis, that the main components of such a majoritarian coalition supporting an inclusive productivism would be three. So first, the workers themselves, right. headquartered in capital-intensive sectors of the economy uh -huh. and, and in the United States, in the Rust Belt industries, right. have to be led to abandon their purely defensive, That's right. uh, their, their simple defense of their existing niche yes. and come to favor a in an industrial conversion, right. a conversion of the Rust Belt industries into a variant of the knowledge economy. That's right. That's and right. in that project, their former, those whom they thought of as their enemies have to become their allies. Right, huh? right. On both sides. Yeah, on, really. both sides yes. on both sides, on both sides. The second component in the coalition uh, is then in the elites. Right. In, in the elites, in the, in the asset holding class, yes. in the money class, yes. there has to be a rupture, a division between the rentiers and the productivists. Right. Uh, between the rent seekers and the value creators. Right. Huh? right. And I claim then that all the growth miracles in modern history, beginning in the 19th century with United States and right. Germany and then Japan right. and then the Northeast Asian tiger economies and then China. In all of them, a faction of the elite rebelled. Right. And its rebellion combined productivism with nationalism. 
and in the name of this marriage of productivism and nationalism, it then appealed to a larger part of the country against the other part of the elite. Right. Huh? So the, and, and that, that was a necessary foundation of all these episodes, all these growth miracles, which then made possible an alternative. Right. Huh? Right. Now, there's a third component, and that's the focus of my question now. I say the majority of people in most large countries in the world now are poor and disorganized. Right but they have a petty bourgeois horizon right. rather than a proletarian horizon. Right. They aspire to a modest prosperity and independence, even though they remain objectively poor. Right. And the default version of that petty bourgeois solution for right. them, right. of that horizon, in the absence of other manifest expressions, right. is isolated, retrograde, family business, right. a little plot of land, right. a little store, a little shop, and so forth. So it would be necessary, so these, this majority is what I would call the subjective petty bourgeoisie. Right. They're not the small business class because they remain poor, but their horizon of aspiration is petty bourgeois right. rather than proletarian. And for there to be such a transformation, uh, the progressives have to present this majority of the subjective petty bourgeoisie uh -huh. with options, with alternatives to the default thing, right. isolated retrograde family business. And at the same time, there have to be a series of initiatives in society, multiplications of forms of collective action right. that create social capital, right. cohesion right. as the result of joint collective action. Right. Now, my question is this. Uh, this is the situation that I claim to exist in the world as a whole. Right. In the United States, do you see or where do you see an equivalent to what I'm calling the subjective petty bourgeoisie, because, and which I claim to be an indispensable part of this producerist majoritarian coalition? I see it in family farmers in the Midwest. I see it in, you know, small... But that's a small minority. That's a little faction of the population, right? Right, but I see it in the, uh, small restaurant owners, small shop owners. There's still a large number of Americans who uh -huh. are small shop owners um, with the... Uh, well, that's a small business class. Yes, so, yes. But, but that's not... So the small business class is not, I think, the majority in any major country. The no. major, my claim was that the majority of people who are not the small business class, but who have this aspiration, this horizon, in the direction, by default, of the traditional aims of the small business class. Yes. Huh? Yes. And that's why I call them the, the subjective petty bourgeoisie right. Right. rather than the objective petty bourgeoisie. Right. Does that exist in the United States and how does it exist or where does it exist? I think it does it, it does exist in the United States in the, the um, in the in the Rust Belt if you are there are still a lot of I mean, I, so I come from Iowa, I grew up in Iowa, and most of Iowa are family farms. There are still some big, there's some big agribusinesses there, uh -huh. but a huge number of residents in Iowa are family farmers. But in the cities where most of the population- There's only two big cities. Yeah. There's, there's like two cities. <laughs> you can't even call them big cities. Des Moines is the largest city, it's 300,000. Yes, but I'm not talking about the country, the United yeah, States. Yeah, yeah. So in, in the, in the cities, in the urban population of the right. United States, which is after all where most of the population, right, what right. most of the population is, right. where, where would you find this subjective petty bourgeoisie? Oh, I, w I think you find them in, um, in all of the jobs that people- So this is what people call the working poor or? Yes, the working poor, and in some cases they they're working poor, and in in many cases they take pride in their jobs. They wish they could, um, they wish they they wish they could make more money in their jobs. But they're the working poor. A number of the working poor are 
you know, are in jobs that they dislike, mm -hmm. um, and they would like a, a job that that matches their interests, depending on what they are. Um, but I think those those are ones that I think can be mobilized. Um, and, um, it, and it so this it would include theoretically, even for example, the voting base of the present Republican Party. Yes, yes, which are which is the part of the working class, which feels victimized by the discourse of meritocracy and diversity. Yes, right? yes, but I think that if the discourse um, of uh, meritocracy and diversity is um, refined or um, is uh, edited or refined, they can see themselves as part of that discourse. I think that, that the, the, the major discourse of a meritocracy and diversity today is framed in institutions like Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, it, they don't, it doesn't need to be that. It doesn't need to be that exclusive. At all, it doesn't need to be based on. I mean, the, one the, for many uh, people today, um, the the I in uh, any shot at achieving the American dream requires one to go to um, college, um, and there are a lot of different kinds of colleges. Um, a lot of the the subjective um, petty bourgeoisie will go to a trade school and do fairly well in a trade school in terms of the earnings that they can make, whether it's in medical technology or whether it's in many other forms. But the narrative, um, the, the narrative of the knowledge economy is, is written for elites today that I think alienates a lot of petty bourgeoisie. So would someone like to join this conversation on, on this theme? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, in thinking about how the small, petite, petty bourgeoisie like notion applies to Americans, I was actually thinking about, I feel like there's like a large strain in this country. I think it actually goes further than that. I feel like the American dream as it's sold like very materialistic in its essence. Very much and so. And it's actually not even about just the comfort of having a, a family business. I think people actually aspire to wealth in this yeah. country. Like they yeah. want, everyone wants a seat. To put it crudely, everyone wants like a seat at the oppressor's table. Almost it seems like we have, there's no vision of collective social transformation. It's just individual escape from an oppressive system. Yes. I don't want to be the person who has right. to serve and kneel and grovel and beg. Right. I'm happy for everyone else to do that as long as I get to escape right. from the rat race. That's very good. That's a very good point, I think. And I, I would add to that that, that, that the definition of the American dream today and for quite a while has been defined in terms of consumerism rather than of producerism. So when you ask people, okay, what's your vision of the American dream? They'll answer in terms of things they can buy. This kind of house, this kind of car, these kinds of clothes, rather than in terms of a producerist vision. And that was the offer to the world, is the anecdote about Franklin Roosevelt and the Sears Robot catalog. Yes, yes, yes. Should, that's should right. Remind that's us, right. Huh? That's right. The, the, the consumer, I mean, that's the, the, the period in which the consumerist vision became to the fore. Came to the fore. Absolutely. 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 So in other words, in the construction of this transformative coalition, this majoritarian producerist coalition, there, is, there has to be not just an agenda of institutional change, but also an agenda of spiritual change yes, yes. beyond the limits of materialism, individualism, That's right. consumerism, That's and so right. forth. So it's, it's a conflict, it's a contest Yes. that transcends the boundaries of party politics. Yes, yes. As politics in the 19th century at the time of Lincoln and Emerson did. That's right, right, that's right, it that's right. It involves a, a, 
what you could call a a religious revival. It, it was and transformation. And, yes, and Lincoln was. I mean, Lincoln is a great example. Lincoln rarely attended church. He rarely attended church. Uh, in the last two years of the Civil War, he started to attend church <laughs> more regularly. But he he never really went to church, although. He knew the Bible better than just about any minister in the country. It's one of the reasons why he became one of the great orators and writers of the time, because the King James Bible is one of the great works of world literature. Um, so he knew his Bible, he just didn't go to church. And uh, that religious ethos was um, foundational in the producerist vision. And it was true with virtually everyone at the same time. Um, you know, in the, in the, if you, when you read Sumner, Sumner continually invokes God. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's uh, foundational. That's Im very important in um, the restructuring of this vision. Uh, I mean, today the vision of the American dream is mostly uh, secular and it's thoroughly consumerist. And indeed, we have to remember that in the development of the moral ideas in the West, the, the, the accumulation of things serves as an alternative to dependence on people. Yes. You know, yes. Robinson Crusoe accumulates things on his island yes. so as not to depend on anyone. Yes. Huh? Yes. But eventually, he tires and wants the company of his countrymen and goes back. Yes. Although he depends upon the company and work of uh, a, an African. Yes. <laughs> so shall we shift to the discussion of democracy or do yes, you want to yes, speak more? Yes, yes. Any other questions on what I've thrown out? Um, So uh, we've already had some discussion uh, at the be in the earlier classes of uh, of politics in the early republic, right? To which I applied the label proto democratic liberalism. Right. There's a republic of notables with practices and arrangements that attempted to filter out and dampen down popular and demagogic influence. Right, right. And the focus today would be on the contrast, that is, on the equivalent political changes, the, the political changes that would be the counterpart to these economic changes right. that we've been discussing. Right. That is, the politics of a high energy democracy right. represented as the counterpart to this inclusive vanguardism, right. uh, which is the leitmotif of these discussions about right. producerism. Uh, and I think it would be useful just so the contrast is presented, it's clear, then to define clearly what I mean by a high energy democracy. Right. So, uh, all of the democracies that exist in the world today are weak, flawed democracies right. in the sense that they are democracies in which the structure of society is largely given. And the, the political transformations expressed in law are like episodic interventions in this received body of social practice. Right. That's the reality. So if democracy means anything, it must mean that the terms of social life are chosen collectively, that they're not just given. Right. But the, these democracies are weak democracies because to a very large extent, the terms of social life are given that's right. rather yeah. than chosen. So that's the first sense of a strong democracy. Right. The second sense is that a strong democracy weakens the dependence of change on crisis, uh, also a continuing theme in our, in right. our discussions. Uh, 
in these existing weak democracies, the rule is no trauma, no transformation. Right. And trauma comes in the two main forms of economic ruin and military conflict, right? right? Depression right. and war. Right. Uh, and so there has to be an exogenous shock to make possible transformation. Right. Given that the regime itself is biased against transformation. Right, huh? right. And then the third attribute of a high energy democracy is that it overthrows the rule of the living by the dead. Right. Which right. is the consequence of the previous two right. distinctions. Huh? That was Thomas Jefferson's obsession. Right. That was his motive when he recommended that the Constitution be trashed every two and a half generations right, right. so that the dead would not be allowed to rule the living. Uh, an idea which is, of course, anathema <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the Americans alive today. Yes. Uh, yes. Now, then the question is, what are the institutional changes that define this high energy democracy and produce this in intended result. And what I want to do is describe them at a point remote from present arrangements so that the direction becomes clear. And each of them can be understood as a solution to a false dilemma. So the first regards the temperature of politics. The temperature of politics is the level of organized popular engagement in political life, the mobilizational character of politics. And this came up in previous classes. Right. A tenet of conservative political science, of, for example, someone like Samuel Huntington, right. is that there's a tension or contradiction between political mobilization and political institutionalization. Right. Uh, Right. They're the opposite. Too much mobilization liquefies in the institutional forms of politics. Right. And that then leads to this idea that politics must be either cold and institutional right. or hot and anti-institutional or extra-institutional. That's Caesarism right. and right. popular agitation. Right. So you have I joked in an earlier class, you either have Madison or Mussolini, right, right. you have the Caesaristic anti-institutional politics, or you have the institutional form. Right. And the response, the, the basic response is that's false. That's a false dilemma, right. because in principle politics can be both hot and institutional. Right. And then that discussion devolves into a series of particular debates about politics and money, politics and media, the electoral regimes, the rules of mandatory voting, and so forth. So you can readily imagine a system in which private finance is not allowed, right. political activity is financed by the republic itself. Uh, Election day is you can't, you, you, you can't distribute, you can't buy television time. It's, right. Right. distributed to the organized social movements and political parties by some criterion which has to be somewhere in between their current representation right. and arithmetical equality because you, if it's just their current representation you just tend to reproduce the existing balance of political right. forces. Right. The, ru the rules of voting, the vote might be mandatory. Right. And the electoral regimes, the regimes of voting. Right. These regimes of voting, like first past the post representation or mm -hmm. proportional representation, have no constant effect. So, in a, in a country that has first past the post, the acceptance of proportional representation can have a mobilizational effect. Mm -hmm. But in a country that has proportional representation, it, like Italy, it can be the opposite. So there's no universal rule. It's a purely contextual judgment. So that's the first, that's the first set of innovations, of institutional innovations in the, in the temperature of politics. You want a high temperature politics on the principle that only a high temperature politics 
has structural fecundity. That is, it's fertile right. in the creation of structural alternatives. <laughs> now we come to the second false dilemma, which has to do with the pace of politics as opposed to its temperature. You want a politics that resolves everything quickly and does so through the engagement of the general electorate. Right. Now, uh, and then in the American constitutional architecture, taking the example of the United States, the problem is that there are two main architectural principles. There's the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, and there's the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. Madison's scheme of checks and balances. Right. The effect of the marriage of these two principles in the American constitutional system is to establish a kind of table of correspondences between the transformative ambition of a political project and the severity of the constitutional obstacles that it has to overcome on the way to implementation. So what is the generic solution to this false dilemma? The generic solution is to reaffirm the liberal principle but to repudiate the conservative one by creating a mechanism for the rapid resolution of impasse through the engagement of the general electorate. Right. And there can be many such mechanisms, a comprehensive programmatic plebiscites, right. or the, the one that I suggested in earlier class. Each of the political branches unilaterally has the prerogative of calling early elections in the face of an impasse. But the elections are always bilateral for both branches, so that the branch that exercises the constitutional prerogative has to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. Right. Huh? That's just an example. Of, and then you accelerate the, the pace of politics. The objective is like Popper's example, right. the, as he says, the aim in science is to make mistakes as quickly as possible. Right. The aim in politics is, is to make these mistakes as quickly as possible. Now then comes the third false dilemma. The third false dilemma has to do with the relation between central power and the power of local government, the states and municipalities. So the conventional view is that there's a pendular relation and an opposition. Either the center has power or the periphery has power. Right. One is the reverse of the other. But the truth is that in constitutional design, you can favor strong central action and radical devolution at the same time. So the government can be formed to be able to ex have decisive options. Politics shouldn't be simply a rehearsal of each party's second best solutions, you should be able to try out things decisively. But as society tries out certain things decisively nationally, it should be able to hedge its bets and allow parts of itself to deviate from the dominant national solutions and generate counter models of the national future. That's the basic idea and the solution to this third false dilemma. Now, of course, in American history, there's a long background to this of states' rights and the abuse of states' rights to promote class and racial oppression. So the exercise of this power has to be vetted both politically by the political branches and judicially by the judges to prevent its, its abusive deployment, right? right. Uh, uh, but this would be the idea. Now, this experimentalist federalism, for once the states would be real laboratories of ex experimentation, right. when in fact conventional federalism imposes a grid that suppresses this experimentalist potential right. of, the, of, of, of federalism. Uh, this experimentalism would advance in, you might think, two stages. The first stage is cooperative federalism. Cooperative federalism, both vertically among the three levels of the federation, 
federal, state, and municipal, and horizontally among the states and among the municipalities. That's the first stage of experimentation. And the second stage is what you would call the right of wide divergence. So it's not just that all parts of the federation should enjoy simultaneously the same power of divergence, because if they all enjoy the same power of divergence, the power of divergence can't be very wide. You can see that because the country would fall apart. It would be like different legal orders and different rules, right. different policies. So exceptionally, a part of the country or even a sector of the economy should be able to apply for very wide divergence. So long as the divergence be vetted judicially and politically, as I said, to prevent abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting to observe that from this standpoint, unitary states like England, like Britain, or France enjoy an advantage over federations. Mm -hmm. Because in a federation, there is a presumption that all parts of the federation must enjoy the same level of right of divergence at the same time. In a unitary state, there is no such presumption. So, for example, in England, the, 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 govern, the British government may be able to strike a deal with Scotland different from the deal that it strikes with Wales. Right, right. Uh, and so there's no, there's no anti-uniformity anti, uh, presumption in a unitary state. That's an advantage. Right. So this combination by the exercise of concurrent powers of strong central initiative with radical devolution is feasible in both federations and unitary states. Now I ask, now just ask the, the practical question. Where, where would you begin among these three sets of innovations? So the, it seems to me that the general attitude of the American progressives about this is the following. The, first, the second set of innovations is the last, everyone would agree, because it has to do with what's sacrosanct, the cult of the Constitution, right. the setup of the government. That necessarily comes last. And it could happen only if lots of other things are changing, right? <laughs> in politics right. and in consciousness. Right. So it seems to me that the American progressives in general think that the place to begin is the first, the rules about money and, poli and media and so forth. I, I, my impression is that they're mistaken and that the place to begin is the third because the re-energizing of American federalism appeals very widely across the division between left and right. right. And once it takes place, changes the whole color of politics, right. raising the level of experimentalism. Now, there are two other sets of institutional innovations to complete the picture uh, that I think merit some, some discussion. So the, fir the, the fourth set of innovations has to do with a practice of transformation which is not established constitutionally in any of these contemporary democracies, but exists in an unrecognized form. So let me describe now, in the United States, the, the practice of the so-called complex injunctions, uh, structural adjudication, in which the government, acting through the courts, intervenes in a prison system or a mental asylum system or a school system and orders that it be reorganized in some way. So, the premise is the traditional form of adjudication is a adjudication in which there are the, the litigants are individual right holders. The evil that is to be redressed is some violation of right. right. And the remedy is the restoration of the situation of right. The, viola the violation is undone. In these structural injunctions, the litigants are some collective entity. The evil is some offense 
of the existing social practice in a particular organization or a particular area of social practice to the ideals of the law, especially the ideal of anti-subjugation. Right. And the remedy is to invade the causal background of a localized part of social life, like the schools, the prisons, the insane, and change it. So it is a form of structural reconstruction that is localized or episodic, but nevertheless structural. So what happens in the United States is that there's no branch of the th tripartite state which is ideally suited by reasons of legitimacy and resources and capacity to do this work. So in the United States, the judges took it on, at least during a certain period in which the progressives had hegemony in the American judiciary. Now, why did they take it on? They took it on because they wanted to. Right. And, and because they weren't ideally suited for this work either. But they did it. Now, they, they, they did it until they ran out of power. So, the, for example, they wouldn't be allowed to apply this practice to the reconstruction of the banks, of the system of finance. Right. They were allowed to apply it to relatively marginal social organizations that is, organizations that contain marginalized people, uh, like the prisons, the schools, and the insane asylums, the mental hospitals. Uh, and, but it, but, so we have there, what, what's the idea behind this, if you now radicalize it, if you generalize it? The idea is that part of society may be caught in a situation of exclusion or subjugation from which it is unable to escape by the forms of collective economic and political action that are available to it. And therefore, the state in a democracy, in a high energy democracy, has the responsibility to come to their rescue. And it comes to their rescue by a form of intervention that is structural or reorganizational, but at the same time localized. Now, because it is structural, it's not appropriate for the legislature. It's not appropriate for the executive. The executive uh, implements the laws. It doesn't change society. And because it's localized or episodic, it's not appropriate for the legislature because the legislature governs through general norms. So it's something anomalous for which there is no entity in the tripartite state. So a different branch of government would have to be created with this responsibility of uh, embracing and implementing changes that are structural, but that are localized, coming to the rescue of groups who are unable to rescue themselves. And it's now done anomalously in the United States by the judges, or it was done, right. Through the, through the form of so-called complex enforcement or the structural injunctions. But ideally, you would have to create another branch of government to do this work. Mm -hmm. Now, the fifth set of innovations is then to add to the elements, to the attributes of representative democracy, some features of direct or participatory democracy, especially, for example, at the outset at the local level. At the national level, through plebiscites, through referenda, not single-issue referenda, but comprehensive programmatic plebiscites and referenda. And at the local level, through par direct participation of the citizenry in the budgetary process and in local government. Uh, and this is an answer to a problem in the institutional evolution of democracy in the modern West. So, the idea of the leftists, of the revolutionaries at different moments in Western history, was to replace representative democracy by a, a, a democracy based on councils or the Soviets. Right, huh? right. And what has happened time and time again in Western history is that this idea of direct participatory democracy turns out to be a feint or a dream or a diversion. It's a moment in the revolutionary process which fails, is cast aside, and then typically leads to some kind of vanguardist authoritarian dictatorship. So 
the, the feasible alternative to this not feasible idea is to imagine then the element of representative democracy as an enrichment of the element of direct or participatory democracy as an enrichment rather than as a substitution of the representative institution. So representative democracy takes on some of the features of direct democracy without ceasing to exist. Uh, so there is, there is a, there's an outline of what I mean by high energy democracy. Right. And that is the alternative then to the proto-democratic liberalism. Right. And how would you initiate this? In the United States, as I said, yeah. I would start by the third set of innovations. That is, if you ask me, I agree that the first set is the second set, the one that has to do with the setup of the government, right. is the least accessible. Right. We all agree about right. that. Right. But then the question is, should you start with the first or with the third? That is, with the stuff about media and money or with the stuff about federalism? And it seems to me that given the political realities and the consciousness of the people, the best place to start is the third rather than yeah, the first. I agree with that. I agree with that completely. Other so John, first your comments, and then I'm gonna we'll, we'll ask the class. That, I asked the main question: how how to how to initiate, how to uh, create, so, how to, how to get the ball rolling yeah. to use a. Uh, so let me say, let me say this because this is an important missing part of what of the remarks I just made. No country reforms its politics in order later to see what to do with a reform politics. This is a common error of, right. of progressives and transformers throughout the world. Uh, uh, you, uh, the, the form of, of politics is changed, or the form of the state is changed, only when it needs to be changed. That is, right. when the country is seeking to redirect its social and economic path, and it can't do it within the straitjacket of the established forms of politics. That's the only way in which it changes. It doesn't change because someone, because an enlightened part of the elite has the idea that this would be a better form of democracy than that form. So the practical implication of what I just said is that the discussion of productivism has a natural priority. Yes. And if you ask me what comes first in the constitutional change, I say, what comes first is the economic change. Right. Nothing about the Constitution. It's only when there's a struggle over the reorganization of the market order for the sake of a productivist project that you then have a basis on which to seek the transformation of politics. You don't seek the transformation of politics in order later to decide what to do with the change politics. Right. That's not how things happen in the world. They ha they, this, this change happens only when it must happen to produce the desired social and economic result. So I would say, first, these productivist experiments regarding vanguard and rearguard, right. la labor and capital, finance and the real economy, and then, as a consequence, the political and constitutional changes, and those changes probably in the particular sequence that I described. Right. I agree with that. So which of the, between the three options, So Vanguard between those versus, first three, so, oh, yeah, oh, Vanguard the, versus Rearguard is one. So I think that in, in the productivist agenda, the one that has a natural priority is the question of the knowledge economy. Yes. Because that's yes. the political reality. Yes. yes. So when there's yes. now this situation in which the advanced form of production is an island, it emerges in an insular form, and at the limit, everyone else in the country is condemned to some kind of make work. Right, right. Everyone is either a servant of that vanguard, That's because right. he's a lawyer or a management consultant, right. or a financier, serving the vanguard, right. or he's doing some kind of make work. Right. So that's the disaster that has to be addressed first. Right. And the problems of the relation of finance to the real economy 
end of labor to capital are subservient to that fundamental issue. Right. So the, the, the first issue is this issue of the path from a knowledge economy for the few to a knowledge economy for the many. Everything else then results from that. Right. Uh, but I think at the same time that in the constitutional agenda, the, uh, the rise of the level of experimentation in the society through the re-energizing of federalism especially yes. could begin very early. Yes. yes. So this is a reality in the United States that most Americans don't know about. The governors in some regions of the country are already associated yes. in regional organizations, yes. especially in the West. Yes. And 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 middle west right. and uh and this is the what they do doesn't appear on the national scene right. but it's one of the main forms of transformation in right. the united states right and so how would uh, i mean roberto you or the others how how might one initiate uh this shift um to a, a inclusive knowledge economy um, from the few to the many. How might that shift Well, itself? that's a discussion we had about these stages, right? In yeah. which I think the first stage is the stage of uplift. So we need to have a 21st century equivalent to the 19th century agricultural extension. So who, who are the benefit, who are the right. targets of this uplift operation? Right. There are two main targets. One are the small and medium-sized businesses that are retrograde. Right. They're pushed back right. into this rear guard of practice and technology. So they have to be brought closer to the frontier. Right. Huh? Right. And by means that are similar to the means that were used for the creation of family agriculture and with entrepreneurial attributes in the early 19th century. Right. The, the land-grant colleges, the right. agricultural right. extension, the agricultural insurance right. to ensure agriculture against its combination of physical risk and price risk, right. and so forth. So there, there has to be the equivalent to that. Right. Uh, and the instruments have to be created for it. So. Uh, it sometimes happens in the world that the state has the instruments and doesn't have the project. That's, for example, what happens in my country. We have these organizations that assist small and medium-sized businesses in Brazil. We have the parastatal network of technical schools right. that support it. We have the development banks, national and regional. What we don't have is the project. Right. In most countries in the world, uh, I think the main exceptions really are Germany and Brazil to this. But in most countries in the world, the instruments don't exist. Right. The project comes before the instruments, then you create the project. Right. So, but, and, and it can't be through the formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. It has to be through some decentralized pluralistic experimentalist system that generates a large range of diverse material which you can then retrospectively select from. That's why I think there's a natural combination, a marriage, between this first stage in the creation of an inclusive knowledge economy and a re-energized federalism. Right. Right. Because the object of re-energized federalism is experimentation. Right. Ex the, the raising up of the level of experimentation. Right. I mean, that, re that requires, I mean, as you pointed out, um, education. Um, and a different kind of education. A different kind of education. But right now, it, it, and not like what's happened to the cause of progressive education in the United States. Right, right. The truncation of John Dewey's program. That's right. It used to be 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you could go to uh, your public college in most states for almost free. Um, you can no, you cannot do that anymore. Um, states have 
um, suck money out of the, they were, they're no longer giving money to their state schools and the cost of education has exploded. Uh, and that's same with a lot of public schools. So how, how do, I mean, does that need to be reversed? Education? Yes. Yes, of course, you need an education so, revolution in the United States. Right. But if I start to say, you need a, a transformation of production. Yes. You need a transformation of the Constitution. You need a transformation <laughs> of education. It's <coughs> the mountain becomes higher right, and higher. Right. But, I, but it's not a system. It's, it, the, the logic is combined and uneven development. So you begin where you can begin, uh -huh. and then you, you advance as far as you can until you hit against the limit, right. which is imposed by the failure to advance on other fronts. Right. But it's not as if it's all or nothing. Right. That you either replace everything or you replace nothing. Right. So in other words, it begins with, I'll call them an activist at a local level, um, seeking to achieve a um, more inclusive... That's not necessarily the way in which it begins. Okay. Because because it can begin by a combination of local, local and national, and, national. And, okay. and, and who knows. But uh, 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 an obvious limitation of the American debate is that the progressives, and this is not true just of the United States, it's a worldwide phenomenon, the progressives have no approach to the supply side of the economy. Right. Right. They have an approach only to the demand side. That's, right. That's what it means not to have a productivist project. Right. Huh? Right. So they have only a distributivist project. Right. So the consequence is that the right appears as the party that speaks for innovation, wealth, creation, energy, and the left then speaks for the humanization of what the right has created. Right. So the left appears on the scene as the humanizers of the inevitable, a losing position in politics. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. I'll, I'll put that's a human true. face on your program. That's, <laughs> that's what the left says. So, and this is what happened in the, um, the, the, the presidencies of the Democratic Party at the end of the 20th century, uh, Carter, Clinton, Obama, uh, they simply normalize and humanize Reagan, right? Yes. So yes. it's much better for the intelligent conservative to have his program implemented by his adversary. Yes. That's much better yes. than for he himself to implement it. Yes. Uh, and that's what happened in the United <coughs> States. So I'm still thinking of how this important and dramatic change can um, gain momentum or initiate momentum. I, don't, I think it's a mistake, and this goes back to a general theoretical point in our discussion. It's a mistake to conflate the contrast between structural and non-structural with the question of moderation or radicalness, right? Because structural change can be, and normally is, fragmentary or piecemeal. Right. So wh what matters most is the direction, not how far you go in each step. Right. Because the steps may be comparatively That's, modest. But For I'm, example, if we're describing this, 20th cent this 21st century equivalent to 19th century agricultural extension. The initiatives that I described as characteristic of that are all very modest. They're, they exist in right. present experience. Right. It's nothing that sort of came from Mars and looks like the commission of pu public safety of the French Revolution. Right. It's very mundane things. But what matters is that they be steps in an alternative trajectory. And that this trajectory have structural consequences and not just be the reallocation of resources from one use to another use. Right. So my basic question is, are there any steps in place right now? Are, are we at a, as a nation, are we at, at pure stasis, or are there, have there steps that My have been impression is that uh, there's an enormous amount of experimentalism in the United States at the local level. 
Okay. So all the Republican governors, for example, would like to have their little Silicon Valley because they don't understand the knowledge economy and they associate it with Silicon Valley. Right. So they think we want ours. Uh, and, and so then, then they build these Potemkin villages, <laughs> which are these sort of industrial <coughs> It's a silly idea, but it's a silly anticipation of something that would be important. Okay. That the underlying concern is valuable, even though its initial expression may be preposterous. Right. Huh? So, if you, so that would be a good place to start. The, exactly. So, yes. so that was so, and, and and what kind of education would right. be necessary right. for that? Right. For example, how the community colleges could become the American equivalent. That's right. To these technical That's schools. Right. That's right. Because That's right. this isn't technical education that that is in the old German model of job specific and specific trade specific skills. You train someone to be an electrician, to right. be a plumber, and so you t you you educate them in higher order manual and conceptual capabilities right. required for the operation of numerically controlled machine tools. Right. That kind of education is on a continuum with uh, uh, the kind of general education that you would want. Right. That right. would privilege analytic and synthetic capabilities over the mastery of dead information that would seek to acquire these capabilities by engaging subject matter content selectively at depth rather than with encyclopedic superficiality right. that would be cooperative in its social setting rather than involve the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism right. and that would be dialectical teaching everything twice from contrasting points of view. Right. So that's the kind of general education. And it's, it's on a continuum with this transformed form of, of technical education. Right. Right. Huh? Right. So, that's great. so g going back to our discussion of first steps, we can, I think, complete a little piece of this argument. So what's the most likely place to begin in the United States? It's the initiatives for uplift yes. uh, that I described, right. targeting both the individualized economic agents, whom we seek to transform into technologically equipped artisans, right. and the, the backward small and medium-sized firms, right. bringing them a little closer to the vanguard right. and offering them some of the advanced technologies in a form that they're capable of assimilating. Right. So that's the first element. Right. The second element is cooperative experimentalist federalism, the first stage of the re-energizing of federalism that I described. And the third element is the cognitive or educational element of the transformation of the schools and right. of the community right. colleges right. as the agents of the, of the skills, the capabilities required by those economic changes. So that's an example of a beginning. Yeah, huh? yeah. And I think that if you look at some of the states in the United States, the, the, the ones that have these changes uh, are, not, are maybe not the ones that you would expect. So, for example, the state in the United States, of the 51 states, the state that has the most favorable Gini coefficient, which measures relative equality, Right. The least unequal state is the state of Utah. It also happens to be the state that self-describes itself as the second happiest state in the <laughs> Union. The happiest, of course, being the state of Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, and it must be in large part because of the presence of the Church of yes, Latter-day yes, Saints. Yes. So it's a Republican state. It's a one-party state, but it's a state with this background yes. of the accumulation of social capital. Right. So, and it's trying to create a local knowledge economy in this direction right. with this heavy influence of the church. Right. So that's something that's happening. That's not something that anyone is, that I'm proposing to you, but I, I'm taking that as a small example of right. these micro experiments right. that come from below right. and that don't necessarily appear where we expect them to appear. Right.
No, I've made a lot of claims, and it seems entirely fair that you would all respond to some of them. Yeah, questions? <laughs> I mean, I, I should just say, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I can say my. Just for Lit. a clarification point, um, when you talk about a different branch of government and institutional structural changes, does that like coincide with the like, amount of bureaucracy we have in the present? Like, would that increase bureaucracy, or is that like an entirely yeah. system? No. Right now, to the extent that that function is performed, it is performed by the judges, by the federal judiciary or at least it was more performed than it's performed now because the political composition of the federal judiciary has changed recently, as you know. But, uh, so what I'm saying is that if you have a task which you believe is legitimate in the existing form of democracy, you look around and there, there's no one ideally equipped and legitimated to do that task, right? So then there are two principles that you, you might have. One principle would say, perform the task whether or not there exists an appropriate institutional agent. Because you'll have to invent the institutional agent later. Huh? So you seize on one agent who's not appropriate and you use that agent incongruously. That's what the judges have done. As, for, as, as much as they could, as I said, until they ran out of power. The second principle would be, if there's a task, perform that task only insofar as there is a legitimate institutional agent. So what has happened in the United States? They have split the difference between these two principles. So what are they doing? They're not disregarding the question of legitimate role but they're not allowing it to become an absolute constraint either. They're just ad hoc splitting the difference between these two principles. That's a description of what happens in fact. But you could say that's the beginning of a transformation in which if, you, if there's no appropriate agent, you use whomever shows up and says, I want to do it, even though I'm not the appropriate agent. That's what the federal judges did when they start to intervene in the schools, the prisons, and the, and the mental hospitals. Said, we'll do it because you, the legislature, won't do it. The executive isn't, isn't doing it, so we'll do it. But they're inappropriate for it. So then you have the function, and in a second step then, you innovate in the constitutional arrangement, and you create a branch of government, a power in the state, designed, equipped, financed, uh, em empowered to do that work. That's how things would happen in the real world. Yes. I have a comment, not a question, so hopefully you have a response to this. But, uh, yes. Uh, more so getting at the expansion of the United States over time, you see things like uh, uh, the number of free states versus slave states, the elites compromising to avoid war for all these years until the Civil War, and even afterwards, the Great Compromise of 1877, where we're seeing um, the expansion of the United States was really how there was structural reforms, and then even the- Where, I, I, you, you're talking too fast, slow down. Sorry, uh, the expansion of the United States westward, really having the structural reforms happening with the growth of the country, but we've, we've capped that growth, right? And then in the 1910s, the number of House of Representatives is capped. And now in recent conversations, you know, everything from the Supreme Court being reformed to um, a liberal side suggesting Puerto Rico or D.C. being statehood. And the conservative side perhaps getting more obstructionist. Um, even way back to the nullification crisis, that, but nowadays being a lot more on the filibuster conversation. So I'm seeing two themes to summarize those. Is one, the, the expansion of the United States making compromise on structure to avoid what would happen in the, the Civil War, especially between free uh, slave elites, uh, sorry, free state elites and slave elites. But, but, but let me understand. Are you saying that the expansion was a way to circumvent conflict or avoid conflict? Yeah. So this is like the old frontier thesis in American history, right? Yeah, but the frontier thesis was uh, articulated for decades, if not a hundred years, um, in a without regard to um, slavery, to the divide between the free states and the slave states. And the, the vast 
um, uh, expansionist efforts were by um, slave-owning Southerners. They were far more wedded on expansion for all kinds of reasons um, than the North. Um, and uh, from the, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, Mex Southerners who waged war against Mexico, had it not been for slave owners, there would have been no war against Mexico. Um, totally, totally. Um, and I, actually that Mexico, as well as their ambitions on Cuba and all that, right. the point more so, more so being about um, in lead up to whenever those expansion ambitions would happen, um, think about James K. Polk, for example, the uh, Mexican-American War in the aftermath of the states. So, okay, we're going to admit states to the Union to compromise it as a slave state or, or a free state. So there was the same number in the Senate. Yeah. Um, now we're talking about transformation changes today, and um, the Senate is still a place where there's a lot of obstructionism. There's the filibuster, and in effort to conquer and get past that, the liberal side is suggesting, well, statehood, D.C., Puerto Rico, which would add senators to that, or Supreme Court reform. Uh, right. Your point earlier on the courts taking more and more of the structural responses, I would supplement that, that the executive branch has had a lot of delegative authority granted over time. Yes, yes. I think it's, it's both branches, but it's the legislative of branch. Of course, the administrative agencies power. have, right? Have the, the administrative agencies would be another, would be an alternative to the judges for this work that's structural but localized. Yeah. But their constitutional objections to the involvement of the administrative agencies in work that involves reconstruction. So you understand what the problem of, of, the, of, of, of complex enforcement is. The judge says there's something about this organization which is frustrating uh, a collective right. Uh, uh, it's, it's not just an individualized violation of right. There's a collective situation which is subverting or frustrating the application of an ideal that we attribute to the law. The law is represented as a set of impersonal of policies responsive to the collective interest, the public interest, and impersonal principles of right. That's this idealizing discourse about law, which now prevails in the United States and the elite. Uh, and so they say, well, in this part of social life, we see a violation of this. So then they have to reach into the causal background of social life and start to fix it so that the vi the, the sources of the violation change. But there's a problem, of course. The problem is that in real social life, everything is connected to everything else. So once you begin to fiddle with the school system or the prison system, because they're imposing a form of oppression on part of the population, where do you stop? There's no natural point to stop. So they, they stop where they have to stop because they don't have the power to continue. So that's the function which would have to have a theory and an institutional role agent appropriate to it. Mm -hmm. the, the, the function is, as I said, coming to the rescue of a group which finds itself caught in a situation of structural disadvantage or exclusion from which it is unable to escape by the forms of collective economic and political action that are available to it. So, the underlying theory of the structural injunctions or complex enforcement would be that. But the judges are not the appropriate instrument for that. You'd have to create another instrument. So that's, that's the idea. That's, right. that's the argument. Or, or else you say, you know, uh, don't have this ambitious view of law as embodying these ideals of equal protection, of anti-subjugation, and so forth. So uh, downsize the transformative ambition in this idealizing interpretation of law. And law deals just with these individual violations of right. It doesn't deal with these large circumstances of collective disadvantage. But once you have this idealizing interpretation of law, it naturally seeks some form of enforcement. 
And that's what, and that, and the explanation is this, yes? How could I say that maybe the uh, collective disadvantaged interest is more adopted by one party than the other? Well, when you think about, let's say, the modern Democratic Party, which is a, a coalition of interests that is seeking to manufacture a majority legislatively, versus uh, on the Republican side, a lot more uh, those that have historically had a lot of power and maintain the preservation of that power. So you take those, that dichotomy of the two, uh, really beyond just the courts or even administrative branch, one party of the alternative, that the false idea there's alternatives, two options, one party is that collective disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And the other party, I guess it would be by logic, the party of advantage. I'm not sure I'm following you because what, what I'm supposing is now an empirical conjecture about the situation of society. In these societies, like the United States, there are, there are class societies. All contemporary societies are class societies. It happens that a particular group finds itself caught in a circumstance of structural disadvantage from which it can't escape. And then you would say part of the promise of democracy is we have to release them from that. Right. And that's why there has to be something like this practice, which is structural but localized, and for which then the complex enforcement is invented. Now I have to point out that the United States is a, a complete anomaly in the world in this, because uh, in, in, in the United States there's this premise that the Constitution is for keeps, right? right. The Union right. and the Constitution forever. Right. Huh? Right. Uh, and, right. and, and, and so the way to change the Constitution in the United States is to pretend that it means something different from which it was previously thought to mean, right? right? Rather than to amend it overtly. Right. But as I suggested in an earlier class, that doesn't work equally well for all forms of constitutional change. That's so that's okay for reinterpreting equal protection or due process, but it doesn't work to reimagine the setup of the government. Yeah. You can't pretend that the Constitution means that there should be five branches of government when it says there should be three. So it, it, so. It, what, what, what happens then in the United States is that the, the, the con constitutional change is tilted toward the reinterpretation of rights and general principles. And that's then the background of this complex enforcement. Uh, rather than toward revision of the setup of the government. Because that's a detailed institutional machinery that you can't pretend means something different from what it's said to mean. Now, the rest of the world has followed a completely different path. In the rest of the world, countries are supposed to have changing constitutions. Many countries have large numbers of constitutions. They change them. When they want to change them, they change them overtly. But starting with the Weimar Constitution after the First World War, that the jurists have filled, and politicians have filled up the constitutions with promises of rights. So they promise everything, these constitutions. They promise the right to happiness, the right to, a, the right to a home, the right to dignity, the right to a career, you name it. Anything that the good thing is promised in the constitution with no institutional machinery to enforce those rights. So, if you started to take seriously that Weimarism, you would say, we have to begin to invent a form of implementation, and often that form of implementation will be localized, but structural, which is the problem that the complex enforcement addresses. So, but that hasn't happened. It, to the credit of the Americans, they've taken it seriously, at least to the point of trying to do it through the structural injunctions. Most of the world hasn't done it at all. They, they've, they've allowed their constitutions to be pietistic documents, which promise the sky to the masses and deliver nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to your example of you talk. I found the point really interesting. Um, which, which example? 
model of this kind of localized development. Utah, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Because so it seems interesting because so Utah is like ninety percent white, right? And so yes, there's yes, a certain kind of yes. social or racial homogeneity, cultural yes. homogeneity. Which facilitates races. the accumulation of social yeah, capital. That's right. right. And so I'm wondering because you defined earlier it said, you know, democracy is this idea of terms of social life being collectively chosen. If this localized approach to experimental democracy produces a sort of heterogeneity because the terms of social life or the conditions of social life in Utah are very different from the ones in New York or Massachusetts. Yes. If that produces a heterogeneity, is that not in itself anti-democratic, right? Because then you right. don't actually have a collective. No, what I would say, I, I, I would say the, the, the best source of social cohesion is cohesion that's created by the different, not cohesion created by the same. Mm -hmm. So if I understand your comment correctly, then cohesion which results from homogeneity is a weaker form of cohesion. So that's true. So it's easier because, but it's weaker, it's more defective because it's not uniting the different, it's uniting the same. So if they're all white, if they're all sort of uh, so-called middle class, right. uh, and they have the same religion and the same moral beliefs, then that's easier. Uh, and that's like social democracy in Europe. So yes. wh why was there social democracy in Europe? And part of it, the, the European nations were tribes, basically, based on consanguinity and affinity. And then against that background of a high level of ethnic, cultural, religious homogeneity, then the state was able to complete the idea of social solidarity through money transfers which is organized from one class to another. Once there are, there's a higher level of pluralism and migratory flows, the inadequacy of money as a social cement becomes manifest. That's what happens now in, in European social democracy. And so you need to have another basis of social cohesion. And I would say the only adequate basis of social cohesion is the multiplication of forms of collective action, especially forms of collective action that unite the different. Uh, that's the strongest basis of social cohesion. And so a practical example is military service, if it really does unite the different, or social service for the mandatory social service for those who are exempt from military service. And, and then you, you, you begin to have different ways in which the different parts of society engage together in purposeful action. So I agree, Utah is, it accumulates social capital, but it has a crutch, uh, which is this similarity, uh, ethnic, racial, religious, and so forth. And the, it's not the highest ambition. Yeah. The highest ambition would be the same thing in New York. Well, that's a different story. Yeah. I mean, the other example I would give would be the Wobblies, which I mentioned. It was they women were leaders of Wobblies. They were um, leaders. They were uh, promoted and recruited. Same with African Americans and same with Mexicans. I mean, it truly was one big union for everyone. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's just a, uh, another example um, that I wanted to um, offer. Uh, so, of course, the, the standard liberal objection to all of this is that this is, this is dangerous, right? Yeah, because, yes. <laughs> because yeah. we... we yeah. <laughs> We evoke <laughs> the spirits of politics. They may not do what we want. Yes. A, a high energy politics. Yes. Uh, and so the idea is let's lock everyone That's up. That's right. Well, let's tie their let's tie their hands to the mass. Yes. And create this perpetual motion machine. That's right. Which then I comes liberal thought, and it says this perpetual motion machine is the neutral order of right. Right. Uh, the problem is that there is no neutral order of right. right. Every, every order of right is tilts the scales in favor of some experiences against others, and the claim of neutrality is then adduced in support of its opposite. Right. That it becomes a way of entrenching. So an order which is always inevitably sectarian is then entrenched, immunized against challenge and change. Nevertheless, 
the false idea of neutrality has a kinship to a valid idea, to a legitimate idea, which is that a form of social life should be open to a wide range of contradictory experience, and above all, it should be corrigible. That is, you should be able to change it in the light of experience. And that must be part of what we mean by democracy, right, right. this idea of corrigibility on the basis of contradiction. Uh, and, and that also explains part of the argument for what I was calling a high-energy democracy. Right. Your um, elaboration sketch on a high-energy democracy, it, based on my interpretation, it would um, return um, workers and the people that are part of this high energy um, or knowledge economy into a producerist ethos rather than a consumerist ethos because it's based on... That would be, to my mind, the most important provocation for the political transformation, as I said. Yes, I don't believe yes. in a political change that happens as, as if you were to say, well, let's change this because this is a more enlightened or freer form of politics. Later, we'll decide what to do with it. That's not how things right, happen. Right, right. You don't decide. You don't change because you, because then you'll ha you'll have a great machine. You'll decide what to make with it. That's not how it is. Right, right. You'll only change it when you need have to change exactly. it to survive, That's to right. walk, to That's breathe. Right. Uh, and so necessarily, the the re the political orientation has to be guided or driven yeah. by this struggle over the economic and social directions. That's, right. That's the only way in which it could really occur. Right, right. right. And this is not how the reformers generally think in the world. They usually think that the reformation of politics and of the state is the mother of all reforms. It has to come first. Right, right. Huh? And that's why the first proposal on their lips is always to have a constitutional convention. That's what happens in the whole world. If people don't know what to propose, they say, let's have a constitutional convention. But if you ask them, what are you going to say in this constitutional convention, they don't know. Uh, and, and so the, the, the change has to be driven by the struggle over the, the economic and social direction. Other questions, criticisms, comments? <laughs> yes. Your last statement, does that say what you've been saying all along, of course, that it's only by crisis that this is going to happen? Economic crisis or war? No, there is, as, there is a circularity there, right? I mean, so. No it's, no, it's different from the point about crisis. So what it's saying is that politics, <coughs> politics is, as it were, the meta level of, in the organization of transformation because the organization of politics and of the state sets the terms on which everything else can be challenged and changed. So in that sense, it has a natural priority. But you only change it when you have to change it because you want to do something else. So I wouldn't say that's an example of the problem of crisis. Uh, it's saying the, pro the productivist agenda has a natural priority. It is the subject. It's what t touches everyday life. And we may not be able to develop that agenda beyond its initial stages unless we change the political envelope. So you go from the discussion of the political and social direction to the discussion of politics. The point about crisis is different, and, it, it, and it, it, it's that under a weak democracy, you can't change unless there's a crisis right. in principle. So Roosevelt needs the depression and the war as an ally and even then he has trouble, yeah. right? Same right. with Lincoln. Lincoln yeah. needs the war. Yeah. 
because it was designed to make it impossible to change yeah. unless there's a crisis. Yeah. So then you said, well, then let's create the institutions, including the political institutions, that facilitate their own revision. The circularity is that the inauguration of those institutions may also require crisis. Thus, so that, that's where, that, that's where these, these two problems might touch. But I think they're different problems, yes. I, I think, again, we are in such a, a firmly fixed society of stasis that at least I don't see the ability to make these changes except when forced. Except, except when forced. Uh, so this is what the poet said, right? Audrey said, talking about babies. He said, they would rather be ruined than changed. <laughs> and this is what's true of all of us. Uh, but, so, but there's an ideal, right? Behind these institutional discussions we're, ha we're having, there's an ideal of humanity that, that, we, that we, to be fully alive, to come into the possession of life, we have to be willing to change. And to diminish our dependence on crisis as the enabling condition of change. So, uh, going back to the, to the abstract discussion, which in a sense frames a lot of these debates that we're having, say, there are two sets of moves that we can have in society. There are the ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted. And then there are the extraordinary moves by which from time to time we challenge and change part of that framework of arrangements and assumptions, normally under the provocation of crisis. Now, what do we want? We want to narrow the distance between these two sets of moves so that the moves by which we challenge and change the framework arise more organically or naturally or continuously out of the ordinary business of life. If we succeed in that, we're freer. Uh, where we, we can be in a framework without surrendering to it. We can be insiders and outsiders at the same time. We're bigger, uh, we're greater. Uh, so that's a definition of our ascent to a higher form of life, which after all is the real underlying object of all of these discussions. Right, uh, right. I think, John, that might be a good place to stop. Yes, that's great. Which is, I mean, it's why I it, uh, would argue the producer's vision is so much more elevated than the consumer. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that was a I think it's counterintuitive for a lot of Harvard students to imagine um, change like the one that we're articulating. Um, well, imagine change really more at the, at, at the, I think you broke it up beautifully, but I, I, essentially the change begins, as you point out, really at the grassroots level. It begins at, not, not, at the, not, not top down, but bottom up. And I think for, yeah, both. But, uh, but ultimately, and simultaneously, right. But it begins, and that's why I asked you, how does it, how does it, how do you initiate it in the examples you gave were, were more. Right. I doubt it. I, doubt. I think a lot of them, yeah, a lot of them, um, a lot of them are wedded to, again, it's, it's the national, uh, they're wedded to Obama. They're, you know, especially at Harvard, a lot of students um, celebrate Obama. And there, there are exceptions, you know, like Skip Day, um, I was at a um, meeting, it was, just, it was a gathering in which 
you know, Skip was like very this, vocal I, I about his frustration like with like Obama after the, I think he was at the end of his presidency. I know, I know, I know. I know. And I mean, if we, his his particular criticism, which I think is really accurate, is that, is that Obama refused to reach out to African American leaders and communities. He basically sought out, you know, mostly the the rich and powerful. That's it. Yes, yes, yes. That's who he loved. I mean, that's who he talked to. Yeah, he loved Bill Gates. You know, that, and that's a valid criticism. That's a, you know, it's. Um, yes, it really is. It really is. He's, no, no. I mean, even when he described, you know, he he wants to see himself following the footsteps. I thought it was something like that we read for her, but it's not. It's like I've looked it up and down. But I have no idea where I came across it. Oh, uh, uh, Jim, uh, uh, Jim, uh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, uh, Koppenberg, Jim Koppenberg, Jim Koppenberg, yeah, it's a whole, I mean, but he is, I mean, I've known Jim since I've, um, since I've been here, I mean, he's, so he's, he, you know, we've talked together in Histon there, but he's, he's an intellectual story of a particular stride. Yes, but completely different than me. I mean, first of all, one of the things I virulently oppose, one, his stance on Obama, and he just, you know, he loves Obama, he writes that book on him, which is just, a, I think, a silly book. Um, and second, more significantly, is that he believes, so as a historian, um, a lot of the historians, arguably most uh, people trained in history and are in history departments, believe in what's known as the objectivity ideal or the objectivity in history. And what that means for historians is this, in my view, lunatic, progressivist vision. For them it means that each generation of scholarship, each new generation of historical scholarship gets closer and closer to the truth yeah. of what happened. And the idea of them being on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. The problem is when you're on the shoulder of midgets. Right? Yeah, but exactly. I mean